So, in the previous lecture uh, we looked at uh, the macromolecular systems, now continuing on we will look at some of the prominent classes of uh, materials uh, which are uh, multiphase system and we begin with uh, a particulate dispersion. Uh, by this we mean the amount of uh, particulate material, uh, in this case uh, this is graphene let us say, uh, is uh, small. So, generally the consistency of these kind of materials uh, will be uh, uh, solvent, viscosity will be of course, more than the solvent itself which is used. However, it will not be very high. So, unlike a polymer melt or unlike uh, uh, some particulate dispersions at very high concentration, these are likely to be very well flow, flow materials which flow easily. For example, if it has to be used as an ink, then usually we, the ink will be fed into a cartridge if let us say we are using printing uh, such as inkjet printing to um, uh, deposit this ink then uh, and uh, therefore, it has to flow through narrow openings and then impinge on uh, the substrate and then provide uh, the uh, let us say either a conducting link or it could also be part of a overall device uh, transistor which is being made using organic materials. So, there are several applications in which uh, graphene ink uh, because it graphene is conducting material and uh, it has very interesting properties as it is a sheet like material and uh, therefore, when it uh, deposits it can form contacts and therefore, lead to high conductivity. And uh, during uh, again uh, the rheology of conducting ink uh, materials such as conducting ink will be very important during processing stage in the sense when device is being made uh, with uh, deposition of these graphene sheets, uh, the ink has to flow out of uh, uh, whatever may be the printing device that is being used or whatever may be the coating device that is being used. So, the flowability and overall rheology of conducting ink is uh, very important in such applications. The uh, other uh, types of uh, multiphase system where we have one liquid and another liquid and uh, the example here is of course, uh, of a microfluidic reactor. In this case, you have emulsions which are could be either water in oil or oil in water and uh, the idea is to get uh, very controlled size droplets and uh, these droplets then are used as reactors. For example, you could have uh, let us say the water phase uh, which is uh, the continuous phase and uh, uh, there is a monomer uh, and uh, uh, initiator and cross linker which are in the oil phase. And so, these uh, then can start reacting and uh, once the reaction is over, the final uh, particle that you get let us say of a polymer will exactly be the shape of this drop itself. And uh, since all the drops are sim same, the overall size of the particle that you get in the end, uh, they will also be exactly the same. So, as you can see therefore, this is being used as a reactor and each and every drop is being used as a reactor. And so, in these cases uh, generally the flow behavior of uh, the emulsion systems is of uh, importance because that will determine how the droplets will flow, uh, what kind of uh, shapes will they acquire and so on. Uh, of course, emulsions are also involved in uh, uh, various other applications such as creams uh, and day to the, the personal care products and uh, therefore, uh, emulsions are generally. Uh, very useful uh, in terms of uh, uh, applications in which we make them flow and then uh, achieve the performance that is required. Now, the other uh, example of a multiphase system uh, which is uh, uh, important is a colloidal gel system. Uh, in this case, uh, very similar to the macromolecular case, uh, we have a chain of uh, particles which actually uh, is present and uh, the chains are actually linked with each other through a network. So, therefore, there is a percolated network of particles and uh, this percolated network in it contains uh, large quantities of solvent. And therefore, this is again a solid like material because of these uh, the network that is present and uh, uh, the applications of this again could be in uh, biomaterials or personal care products. Many of creams that we use uh, actually belong to this class because we generally have a crystalline uh, 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 let us say a triglyceride uh, wax which is uh, deposited out in terms of uh, these particles and then they form uh, the uh, network uh, in which the fluid is also entrapped and then this material is applied on the body and uh, does its job of uh, cold cream or several other such applications. So, these materials are uh, solid like in their response. Uh, 
which means that uh, uh, from in common parlance if we place this material uh, uh, we, we have to cut it through a knife is what uh, is generally said in terms of uh, or, or if we take a, a small piece of it and put it uh, it will retain that shape uh, at, at least for a significant amount of time. And so, uh, but these materials are not necessarily uh, they are not hard like the glassy materials and therefore, uh, uh, they, they belong a different class. Uh, we will also see uh, uh, as opposed to the glassy state here actually the uh, particles uh, are joined uh, with each other due to some attractive uh, interactions between them. But you can see that this uh, set of particles here can actually do a little bit of dangling. So, just the way in a macromolecular network which was a hyd uh, hydrogel the chain between two cross link point can actually uh, move about, uh, but because of these overall cross links uh, the material itself has an overall rigidity and therefore, it is called gel. Similarly, in case of a colloidal gel also we have these uh, uh, chains of particles and the chain itself is not uh, completely rigid and therefore, uh, some amount of soft solid uh, nature is uh, there in these systems because of the flexibility of these chains. And of course, uh, over and above uh, the colloidal gel are also different from macromolecular gels in the sense that these cross linking points are physical. So, therefore, it is like a physical macromolecular gel and not a cross linked macromolecular gel and so these cross link points can also form and break. So, therefore, the colloidal gel system uh, response will uh, be uh, quite uh, soft solid like and so the relaxation time uh, that are there for these materials. Uh, though the largest relaxation time we will see uh, uh, can be high, uh, but we will also see the presence of uh, several uh, smaller relaxation times. Colloidal glass on the other hand is a caged uh, structure of particles. Here uh, each particle is not able to move out because of the cage that is built by several particles which are surrounding it and uh, thermal energy is not sufficient for these particles to move about freely, so that this particle can escape. Once in a while of course, due to thermal events uh, particle motion is possible, but in general <coughs> the case structure of particles leads to entrapping solvent as well as uh, uh, the uh, limited mobility of each and every particle. And so again there we have a solid like response and generally these colloidal glasses are being used as model systems to study the glassy state, because many times it is more difficult to analyze an, uh, a molecular glass in terms of uh, what kind of arrangements it has and in terms of uh, simulating uh, the realistic behavior. On the other hand colloidal particles are uh, far more easy to visualize and also manipulation of interactions between different colloidal particles can be done by tuning the either the surface of the particles or maybe the conditions of the solvent. And so therefore, they become a model system to study the glassy state and the glass transition. And so, the glass transition can happen also maybe by changing the interactions. So, under one condition uh, the particles are uh, uh, relatively mobile and under some condition the particle become frozen. And so, again so this uh, situation is very analogous to what I described where the molecules as a function of temperature are frozen. So, in case of macromolecule also we have this uh, glassy to rubbery transition where uh, there is segmental mobility and then there is glassy state where uh, all the motion is frozen. So, similarly in case of uh, colloidal glass also we will go through such uh, transitions and so approach to glass transition and the glassy state can be investigated uh, if we effectively uh, manipulate the interactions and try to understand their role on uh, the overall behavior of the system. So, in general after having reviewed uh, the macromolecule and uh, multiphase systems uh, by themselves, uh, all possible combinations of uh, these uh, is also there. In fact, uh, more often than not the commercial systems that are available uh, actually will combine both macromolecules and multiple phases in an overall system. So, polymers and then uh, liquid uh, maybe two liquids, uh, maybe different solids and gas. So, for example, foam is a very uh, foam is a mixture of gas and liquid and uh, to, to modify the properties of the interface uh, uh, a material such as protein or some other polymers can be used 
and so therefore a foam actually will contain uh, liquid gas and polymer so generally multiple phases as well as uh, macromolecules are incorporated in uh, several uh, systems and uh, these are some examples for we have an emulsion uh, where uh, polymer adsorbed polymer is used to improve the stability uh, of the emulsion polymer melts are uh, used as we already said uh, to process uh, the materials uh, which could be used uh, in structural application or applications such as chairs and uh, instrument covers and so on and uh, if you want better properties from these polymers then uh, we actually fill it with uh, particles so these are reinforcing particles and so when we process this uh, material uh, the rheology of polymer melt uh, is uh, not so much of interest but uh, we what we should really understand is what is the rheology of uh, polymer melt with the particles there and uh, the particles uh, interact with the polymer melt the particles interact with each other and uh, if we have particles which are let us say rod like then these particles may also orient uh, due to deformation and therefore uh, one uh, needs to understand the rheology and flow behavior of particle filled polymer melts for quite a few engineering applications. Similarly, we also have a, a micelle system uh, in which case let us say if nanoparticle is being used uh, as part of a drug delivery system then we have a micelle which is formed with polymer and then there is a particle also there. So, these are all examples of material where there are macromolecules and there are uh, multiple phases. So, in the next uh, uh, few uh, uh, examples that we will look at belong to these class and because of their inherent complexity uh, most of the rheology these days is done for materials which are for uh, is called uh, complex fluid or soft matter. So, these are the materials where uh, thermal energy is sufficiently high for uh, uh, molecular and particle uh, motion flexibility at the same time they uh, are uh, composed of uh, multiple uh, length scale and time scale response because of their uh, complex makeup. And so, uh, when we say rheology of complex uh, flu uh, materials uh, we mean that we are in this course we are going to look at rheology of complex fluids or rheology of soft matter. And so, the uh, examples that we look at uh, we will start with a material which is uh, quite commonly used uh, curd uh, and curd is again a solid like uh, material uh, we would like it to be uh, less runny uh, when it is consumed uh, for us to give a good feel about uh, uh, its uh, richness and uh, texture and uh, curd is basically formed by a network of proteins uh, which are uh, which is uh, casein uh, which comes from uh, milk of course and milk also has these uh, of course fat and water and and so in uh, curd what we have is a network of these proteins is formed which gives us this gel like structure uh, it gives us the solid like response and then in that these flat globules are actually fat globules are uh, 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 entrapped and of course, there is overall uh, aqueous uh, uh, medium also which, which is part of the milk. So, curdling process uh, is basically the formation of the network of the protein and uh, formation of these uh, entrapment of these fat globules in a otherwise continuous medium of water. And so, clearly in terms of uh, uh, eating of the curd uh, rheology is important because the way it appears in a uh, dish or the way it appears uh, when we take it in spoon or uh, take it by hand uh, it is very important uh, how it feels. Uh, we, we first impression of how it uh, is is based on the rheological properties uh, in the plate or while we are in the process of eating it. The next set of rheological uh, in, uh, features which are very important is when we eat it. So, how, how it uh, feels when uh, it is being chewed on or in when it is being uh, manipulated in our mouths and what kind of feeling does it lead to. So, in both cases uh, what happens is this uh, uh, network of uh, proteins and uh, the fat globules uh, this is all responding to the deformation that is being imposed on it and therefore, rheology of uh, such a system is very important in terms of understanding and trying to get the right type of uh, rheology especially given that now we have multiple products which come in a commercial uh, large scale uh, production and so 
uh, the companies which are making curd uh, will be inherently looking at uh, rheological response of it under different conditions. Uh, the other example of a multi-phase uh, multi-component uh, and micellar system is a copolymer micelle. Uh, this is a copolymer which is called a block copolymer because there is a block of uh, polyethylene oxide which is uh, depicted in black here and polypropylene oxide. And so, uh, we have uh, basically two blocks of polyethylene oxide uh, on the two sides and in the center there is polypropylene oxide. And uh, polyethylene oxide is uh, hydrophilic while uh, polypropylene oxide is uh, not as hydrophilic, it is hydrophobic, uh, relatively more hydrophobic. So, if we put this uh, molecule in water and several such molecules are there, then what happens is all the hydrophobic uh, domains of polypropylene oxide would uh, come together and therefore, a micelle is formed. So, when this copolymer is put in uh, water, uh, we get micelle, where all the hydrophilic uh, domains of polyethylene oxide are exposed to the solvent and uh, while the uh, polypropylene oxide are sort of exposed to each other in terms of uh, and uh, create a hydrophobic core. So, we basically have a hydrophobic core surrounded by a hydrophilic uh, shell. And when uh, these uh, the concentration and temperature are uh, uh, appropriate, these uh, micelles actually assemble themselves uh, into different uh, arrangements and therefore, this again leads to a gel like uh, material. So, this kind of a micellar system uh, can be used very effectively let us say for drug delivery because depending on if, if a drug is uh, hydrophobic uh, and quite uh, often drugs are. So, it, it could be encased in this kind of a micelle and the overall uh, uh, formulation could incorporate a gel like this and when it goes to the target organ, then uh, depending on the conditions there, uh, the uh, uh, overall gel could break up into individual micelles and in even individual micelles could break up and therefore, the drug then can be released uh, at a very targeted uh, location under targeted conditions. So, therefore, these kind of copolymer micelles are as, uh, one among several materials which are being investigated for uh, drug delivery applications. Again, uh, this is an example uh, where I have tried to emphasize the macromolecular nature of the polymer because these uh, uh, are block copolymers, but the way they assemble themselves, uh, it is essential to look at their response through the micelle and in fact, arrangement of micelles. So, even though in this case, effectively no new phase is being added, the overall analysis of uh, this system uh, has to be done in the context of the micelle and it is the arrangement of these micelles in a solvent. So, therefore, we are looking at if it as if a multi-phase system. But given that uh, the uh, this is not a really a droplet or a solid particle, in fact, these are polymer dangling chains and so the interaction between uh, different micelles or how the micelle breaks up or how the micelle forms, the macromolecular uh, nature of uh, the uh, entity which is making up the micelles and also the micelles which make up the gel, uh, micromolecular uh, nature is not uh, cannot be ignored. So, therefore, this is also another example of a macromolecular multiphase system. Now, the next example uh, that we uh, will look at is a filled melt. Uh, as I mentioned earlier that uh, many of the application uh, a composite is used, a polymer composite where a reinforcement uh, like a glass fiber is added on to nylon, let us say which is a polymer which is quite often used for several application. And uh, so, what we have in this case is uh, uh, the macromolecules of nylon uh, which are uh, uh, entangled mass and in this we have these glass fibers and this overall uh, system has to be processed in injection molding or whichever process is being used for processing the material. And uh, because of uh, these glass uh, material are usually in a fibrous form, the glass fiber can orient itself also. So, the processing uh, not only is important from the point of view of making sure that we get a final part which is uh, free of defects and so on, uh, depending on the processing condition, we may end up having these glass fibers orienting themselves. 
So the properties of the final part will depend on what type of processing was done on it. So in this kind of case, not only are we interested in rheology for just ensuring that we get a product which is free of defect, in this case we use the rheology also to get manipulate uh, the processing condition in such a way that we get an optimum orientation of glass fibers at the end, so that we get a part which performs appropriately. So it is not uncommon to uh, manipulate the overall geometry of the part in such a way that glass orients in certain sections much more wherever let us say there is a higher stiffness required in one particular direction and some other parts where the glass fibers may be randomly oriented. So therefore rheology of uh, such uh, filled materials is very important. So we have to consider the, uh, the macromolecular uh, mechanisms that are involved. We also have to consider the interactions between macromolecule and the glass particle, uh, glass fiber and also we have to consider the orientation of glass fiber itself. And if uh, let us say the glass is being used at high concentration, then the interaction between glass, uh, one glass fiber with other glass fiber will also have to be considered. So therefore in this case, uh, we uh, have to incorporate uh, interactions and mechanisms based on macromolecules as well as the particulate systems. And so rheology of these systems is of great interest. Uh, the uh, final system that we will look at uh, is uh, from a plant cell wall, uh, where actually what we have is a, again a network of pectin. Uh, pectin is a polysaccharide which is part of all the plant cell wall. And uh, in this case the calcium is uh, there as a crosslinker. Uh, in fact, there are certain uh, two different types of crosslinkings. Uh, one set of cross link where actually there is a calcium bonding uh, the subsequent uh, uh, neighboring portions of uh, the pectin molecules and this is kind of a cross linking point is called an egg box kind of uh, cross linking because in this case uh, what happens is uh, we have uh, basically pectin molecule. So different uh, pectin molecules uh, are basically aligned like this and uh, then the calcium which is there uh, is there as a cross linker. So it is acting a cross linker between different pe pectin chains and therefore this is called an egg box cross linking. While we also have on the other hand uh, a single uh, cross link point. So both of these crosslink points are there and the relative distribution of these crosslink points of course determines uh, what is the overall behavior. Uh, the crosslinking also gets affected based on the nature of the pectin and so in fact there are enzymes in the plant cell wall which control how much uh, what is the type of pectin is there and how much hydrophobic and hydrophilic group uh, that are there. And so methylated pectin for example uh, is uh, more hydrophobic and uh, therefore the properties are very different. Uh, methylated pectins cannot be cross-linked as much because calcium requires a hydrophilic group for cross-linking. So pectin itself uh, determines uh, some properties of this plant cell wall, but what is also important, equally important is the cellulose microfibrils which are there. And uh, the mechanical properties of uh, this overall uh, system which is the plant cell wall is very important uh, during the growth phase. Uh, so when a plant is growing and it is adding on cells, so in those cases uh, which direction uh, does the cell growth happen, uh, what are the properties of uh, cells when the growth is happening, all this is determined based on biochemistry of this system. So it involves a macromolecular crosslink system and it involves a particulate uh, microfibrils. And of course, uh, there are other components such as hemicellulose which are also there which I have uh, left out in this uh, somewhat simplified picture. And uh, what is important again is uh, preferential orientation of uh, cellulose microfibrils. Uh, so for example, if a uh, plant cell wall uh, needs to be stronger in one particular direction, then the cellulose microfibrils will all be oriented in that particular direction. So, what we have seen so far are uh, examples uh, of uh, macromolecular multiphase systems uh, which are uh, fairly complicated because uh, we have to incorporate mechanisms 
uh, of both macromolecule and multiphases. And of course, all the systems we saw uh, rheology is extremely important because the material behavior under deformation is a key concern either for processing of the material or for its performance. So, generally uh, when we are looking at uh, from a rheological viewpoint and we are looking at let us say a material system, uh, the key question that have to be addressed are uh, we, we should have an idea of what are the key features. Uh, I, I tried uh, mentioning several such features depending on uh, what the material system was. So, in case of polyvinyl alcohol there was hydrogen bonding uh, cross links. Uh, in case of let us say a glass fiber filled melt there was also orientation of glass fibers. So, there are several key features of uh, macromolecules or the uh, dispersed phases uh, that uh, are important for analyzing the rheological responses. These features lead us to sort of conclude what might be the mechanisms uh, at a molecular or a microscopic scale. And uh, uh, of course, we need to be very aware of what uh, may be the applications. Uh, if it is a new material then what is the target application, if it is a replacement material then we know what the application is like uh, is going to be. And so, uh, one other key question that we need to know is what type of rheological response is relevant for a given application and this material. As uh, I have highlighted during the introductory lecture also that uh, it is possible sometimes to look at shear flow alone, some other times we need to look at extensional flow. At some times uh, steady response of material is sufficient, some other time time dependent response of the material is required. So, therefore, what type of rheological response is relevant is a key question. And uh, of course, uh, one important feature is uh, doing rheology under controlled condition in a laboratory setup. How is it useful and how can we relate this rheology to overall performance of a material if it is a product or overall performance of a material in terms of processing is equally important. So, once we uh, have come to uh, some of the answers to the previous set of questions, the next set of questions that uh, we need to answer so that we can do our rheology more effectively is what is the type of deformation that uh, we should investigate, what is the type of uh, deformation, what is the type of response. Uh, and uh, as rheologist one important feature is to capture the uh, rheological response using quantitative measures. So, we will see that we will define material functions which are very useful for quantifying the rheological response. Uh, as opposed to a Newtonian fluid where a viscosity as a single constant characterizes the overall flow behavior, we will see that there are several quantitative measures which are possible to, uh, to be used for a complex uh, materials uh, such as macromolecular and multiphase systems. And so, uh, the next question uh, set of questions are related to uh, how can we uh, use the microstructural knowledge uh, in understanding and predicting the deformation behavior. Uh, also importantly because uh, for example, when uh, we talk about uh, eating of curd uh, due to the deformation being imposed uh, either while uh, uh, using it, serving it or in terms of eating it, the microstructure is continuously getting modified. And therefore, in the end what we feel as its mouth feel depends not just uh, on the deformation, but also since the microstructure is getting affected by deformation, uh, these are closely linked. So, we need to know microstructure under rest, but we also need to know microstructure under deformation. And so, of course, uh, the hope of a rheologist is that if we are able to answer uh, the questions related to the previous uh, two slides, then hopefully we will lead to an option, uh, optimum formulation of material systems. Uh, hopefully, these materials will have an effective performance, uh, processing is more effective and uh, so that the thickness of the film that is being obtained or the consistency of a product which is being obtained is consistent and also the processing itself is efficient. And uh, of course, uh, uh, all of these uh, effectively done along with uh, the general uh, cost and economic viability issues which are there for any product or process uh, will eventually lead to sort of rheology playing an important role in uh, determining the overall uh, application of the material system for a particular uh, case. So, with this we have uh, now uh, laid the stage in terms of introductory material uh, which uh, we should be aware while we uh, go on to look at uh, 
the rheological performance and rheological properties of uh, materials. Uh, in the next set of lectures now, we will uh, start looking at first uh, some uh, preliminary descriptions of uh, the flow of materials and deformation of materials and the stresses which arise in the material. So, once we discuss the stress, strain and strain rate in the material, then we will be in a position to start looking at the rheological response of the material systems.